बच्चों के इंटरेस्ट की हु इज ही He's an, a man with heart and damn sure integrity. A veteran and served on the police force for 30 something years. But see, see it's more to Joe Gondarski. He is a writer, a director, a grandfather, a father, of course. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. I I'm like getting into a story like if it's mine or something, you know. I just you know, just appreciate all that you know Joe has done and and he's just so down to earth and just you know to be honest with you the most coolest thing though that I love love about Joe Gandowski now don't get me wrong he's done some amazing stuff you know especially in the police force and stuff like uh, oh, man he was a detective he was a negotiator man he did it all served our country i mean And okay and then the man on top of that is creative director he has movies but you know what just an amazing grandfather and he has his special times and moments with his grandson is a big part of his life as it should be but Joe's that that authentic real grandparent that has those stories that 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 the grandkids can be like man I remember when grandpa You know, and to be honest, that's what I found the most most amazing about Jogonarski. Him and how he is with his grandkids. I mean, to Can you just imagine all the stories? I mean, just from what we were talking about, I was just like, wow, we could have kept going and going. <laughs> But hey, let me just uh here I go again, talking way too much. Let's allow Joe to do the honors and share about who he is and give us his voice to our show of voice to be reckoned with. Come on in, Joe. Welcome. Hey everybody, welcome to my show, Voice to be Reckoned with with Brandy J. Today I have with me special guest Joe Gendersky. Uh he is here to share with us some of his, some of his awesome work that he has done. And Joe, are you there? I'm here. How are Good you? Thank you for coming on and hanging with us today. So happy to have you here. My pleasure. So Joe, oh my goodness, so many so many things <laughs> that uh we want to know. Definitely um what's what stood out for me with with you is that uh you were you served your country, which I, I find commendable. Much love for all my veterans. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh yes, 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 most definitely. The highest respect. <laughs> Um also I know you were you said you were in the police force for uh, 31 years. Yeah. Okay, and you are a direct a writer, director writer, am I correct? Yeah, actor, writer, um the screenplays, yeah. Try to be creative. That's, yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So um as you were, you know, <clears throat> uh you know, growing into your own as as far as career wise, Uh when you served in the the police field had you always had a uh like a passion for writing and and creative and directing and things like that? Well, it was funny because when I uh finished my service in 1970, 69 actually, I uh took a, a an acting course and uh in 1970 I called to go to the police department. Well, that kind of interrupted my plans to go into the creative field. So um I kind of put it off until I was uh, retired and then I took some more acting courses and uh uh got I wanted to do a few plays I did a few plays here in Chicago Chicago's a great city for plays uh so there's a lot of community theater so I did a few good men and uh a few other plays and then I got into indie films and uh that grew and then I 
decided to take a trip to LA and uh, uh, back in the 2008. And I would go for like two or three month periods, which is impossible because uh, to do anything. But I was lucky enough to get on uh, uh, a couple of shows, Criminal Minds. And I also played uh, uh, the uh, senator in the, the, the bad guy senator in the movie Chavez with, uh, about Cesar Chavez. So it was good. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. Wow. Okay. So like, like many for you, your creative was always there growing, you know, basically all your life. You have yeah, always... I, think so. I think so. I always like to, to, to get involved in creative uh, ventures. And I, of course, afterwards, uh, all during the time that after I retired, I took acting lessons and, and uh, studied things and, and did a lot of some writing. I had some good writing op learning opportunities. Uh, so it was good. Yeah, it keeps me busy. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And uh, serving the military, that's amazing. Um, and then pol the police force, 31 years, that's a, a long time. So you've done a lot. You've seen a lot. You, yeah. You're the real deal. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. I mean, Chicago is a, a tremendous city for, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the second largest police department in the United States. So it was a lot to see, a lot to learn. I was fortunate to work with good people and uh, rise through the ranks and um, get to be a detective, and among other things. And I even had three different stints on the horse horse unit, which was unique. Um, and so it was a, a, a exciting and good career, and and uh, developed a lot of friendships and and uh, relationships with people, and both on and off the, the department. You know, so it's not just I don't just hang around with just police officers. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. You, uh, you um, have, I noticed, you know, because I, I, I had a thing for, I had wanted to, at some point in my life, enter, I always just like read up like books and stuff about our, the, our rights and, you know, I always knew the amendments and then the law and stuff like, I always found that interesting. So, you know, I attempted, you know, I had a moment where I was trying to get into that, the field, but, you know, and I'm going a different direction in the business, but, uh, yeah. You know, you, you were on uh, one of my favorite shows, you know. Well, actually, my yeah. favorite show, Criminal Minds. <laughs> yeah, <You saw> that? <laughs> yeah that, was, that was a unique experience, yeah. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure it was easy for you since all, all of your, you know, your real-life experiences of, of working in the field. Yeah, I mean, I played a police captain uh, in a short role, but it was, it was fun and the people were terrific. That's awesome. That's what I, was, I always tell people, and it's like a joke, but it's not because I'm kind of serious. I tell people, I was like, I feel like I get smarter. I've gotten smarter ever since I, the, the years I've watched Criminal Minds. You know, I feel like I think like a profiler. I'm like a, like secretly like a undercover profiler. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I had the opportunity while I was a police officer, while I was a, a sergeant, to go to the FBI Academy. And I went, I went there for 12 weeks. It was a management course. One of the things we studied was profiling because the movie had just come out. Um, what was the movie? The, the, the one about profiling the, the serial killer, Hannibal Lecter. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Was it? Anyway, so it was very popular. And so I met all those guys from the profiling unit and we did, so, and I took a course on uh, abnormal psychology uh, at the FBI Academy. So it was very interesting. And we ended up, we had to, our assignment at the class was to profile two homicides from your own jurisdiction so i i profiled two homicides from chicago among the hundreds and hundreds that were there wow that's pretty awesome i would love to do i mean that you know to to have to do something like that obviously somebody had to have you know had a tragedy but so yeah. but i would still love to like be able to do something so i don't know i just find it fascinating how you know because sure. you have to think a certain way you know right you have to try think like the weirdest person that you ever knew. <laughs> you know, you're a serial killer. And so you have to kind of put yourself out into that mindset and understand. Yeah. Uh, and they tried, the, the FBI tried to, uh, they talked about how they ended up developing this, this uh, uh, profiling was to talk to serial killers who once they're in for life, there was, there was no, you know, most of them wanted to talk anyway. So uh, they learned and they were able to analyze the data that they got and, and uh, come up with a, an idea of how to separate and how to uh, assign certain traits to
to people uh, based upon what they did and, 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 and relative to the crime. Wow, that's pretty pretty awesome. Well, I figure since I can't be a real profiler in real life, I'll just be my own profiler in my everyday life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We do that every day. I mean, I find myself constantly, I mean, all my life I've been involved in, in analyzing people in some kind of way or another. I also am a licensed professional counselor in the state of Illinois. I don't practice, but I, I, I keep up my license, so I have to go to classes uh, to keep my license. But um, it's just a study of, of humans, you know, and of course the police department gives you a wide variety to study, you know, so to try and understand how, what makes people tick. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I work with kids, you know what I mean? I've been working for almost like six years. So I find myself in these situations where I have to figure, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm trying to solve something, especially when you have one yeah. kid saying one thing and the other saying the other, they're both believable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I have to, you know, and I have to like put the, you know, kind of like use my, you know, and it kind of yeah, works. That's funny. I, what, what your kids do you uh, deal with? Uh, you said what, what, what age? What, whole, what age? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, our school is from kinder, kindergarten to eighth grade, but I, I actually work with um, kinder to third grade. Right now, oh. my active class is second and third. It's a combination class. Oh, that's going to be fun. You see oh, yeah, for, for sure. I have, a, I have two grandchildren. One's a, a boy, three, and a, and a little girl, one. And, I, you know, it, it, they amaze me every day. You know, <laughs> kids, are, kids are so smart nowadays. They really are. Yes, yes, very smart. We kind of, we have a tendency to um, underestimate, you know. Yeah. The ones, but they're they're pretty uh they're pretty on it. <laughs> you gotta I watch it I, too. Yeah, when I was three, I think I was still eating crayons, and so they, <laughs> kids, kids know all the electronics and they know how to put stuff on the screen. And my, my mm -hmm. son and daughter, you know, are very uh, vigilant in making sure that they do not, you know, their screen time is limited, so they don't spend all their time watching uh, devices, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, because, you know, I, I'm a, a seven, well, not seven, I was born in 78, so basically an 80s baby, but it's not like, you know, before, like back then, I remember climbing trees and just being outside, like with all the other kids, like until the street lights, you know what I mean? Exactly and, right. Uh, well, you were still right on the edge, uh, the edge of that uh, era that I was. You came home when the street lights were on. Yeah. You, know, you had to report in for dinner. Yeah. You know, now, nowadays, kids are like, inside or they're just wherever they could oh, get beyond God. social media they don't even socialize really anymore it's all through the social know. media you know and it's, it's very you, unhealthy you see the kids these kids they want to be with they want to become social they want to play with each other they want to learn but you know to be outside like you said when as soon as you got home from school you you threw the books on the side and you ran as far, fast as you could to find your friend you know yeah to, to play and to, to be out out for sure even in Chicago when it's dismal in the winter time you know for four, five months you're still you just it doesn't matter you put your clothes whatever clothes you had on you went out there if it snowed you played in the snow if it rained you played in the rain if it was muddy you played in the mud you know so you just you didn't want to stay in oh god that was torture to stay in yeah for sure now it's just like kids do everything online, everything. And I think what the thing is, they don't really know how to socialize or it just doesn't. I notice like with the kids I'm working with, it's, it's very difficult to get them to, uh, to respect one another. And so that's where I'm at right now with being kind and empathetic to one another. There's always at each other, you know, and it's right. kind of like they probably don't get that much time to just be out and just, you know what I mean? We growing up, you know, without electronics like that back in, and you know, you're in my time, you, you know, you, we were so, you know, we were able to do those things and, and, and learn those, uh, those, those things you do, you know, disagreements or, or if somebody right. gets in a fight, you know, or, you know what I mean? It, it now it turns right. into cyber bullying and oh kids hurt. It's crazy. I mean, you know, if you were a bully, you got knocked on your butt, you know, and, and so, uh, I mean, you, you learn to negotiate life and people right. that way. And, and you had mentors. You had older kids would, you know, tell you what to do, or your older brother, your siblings, you know, you, uh, 
or your, your friends would help you out because you were in a group of friends, you know? And so it was like, we had a very close group of friends. In fact, my friends that I grew up, went to grammar school with were closer than, uh, than the high school kids because we still have, I, I still have breakfast every Saturday tomorrow with uh, four to six of my grammar school friends and that we were all veterans. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That is very awesome. And I'm telling you, it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's it's crazy because I have a 12 year old, and me, I have to like you know remember to to make sure that he's not just on his device. But the way the world is now too, it's kind of like it's scary to even you really you know what I mean. Want yeah. them to like it's not you throw your books down, you run outside, and you know that the, the kids are okay with the neighborhood kids and all that. It's not like that anymore because you know you've got so much going on with the more drugs and kids getting access oh, yeah. to it and using drugs. You got the legal. Yeah, we got a, oh, we got a horrible situation here with opioids. These kids are dying. Yeah. And <clears throat> terrible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the thing is, now, you know, they have play dates and all that other stuff. You know, you didn't need that. You just came and started playing, you know, when you were a kid. Yeah, so it's, sure. We're too insulated. Um, you know, many years ago, when I was getting my master's degree, and I was getting my counseling degree, uh, I had to do an internship. And this is way back, and I remember this, this is way back in probably 1989, there was, I had to go to a lecture and this guy, he laid it all out then. He says, you know, we're in for trouble. He says, we're raising a lot of hothouse flowers. We're so insulated of, of these kids. They're not gonna be able to, to survive outside that hothouse. When they get out into the real world, they're gonna, they're gonna crumble. And uh, he was right, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of angst out there, you know, for these kids. I, the police, young police officers on, on Facebook and some pages are, are police only pages. So they talk and they complain about whatever. And you could see it's a whole different generation that's becoming police officers than I had. You know, I'm an old baby boomer. So these kids are all millennials. So they have a whole different way of looking at things. They're like, yeah. they're on their, on, on their cell phones, you know, before roll call, for instance, just texting other people. I mean, before roll call, before you went out on the street, it was like a social time. You, you know, you talk to each other. How's your wife? How's the kids? How's it going? Hey, you know, and then the, the watch commander would come and give you your assignments and tell you what's going on crime wise. And then you'd go out into the street, but it's, it's not like that anymore. It's a whole different vibe. Yeah, for sure. I did a show with a gentleman before and he used to be working in the police field and he made an interesting point and he said, you know, like with the new generation of police officers, he said from his, where he came from, you know what I mean, being, you know, being exposed to like, you know, he was one of the ones that got outside, socialized and all that stuff and, and ran in the neighborhood and there was a big difference between that, you know, how you react to a situation as a police officer, he said, he, he's been in many situations where he probably should have pulled the gun out or something like that, but he didn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. And but versus the new age ones, it's like, because you, you're not exposed, you were always at, the one that was at home, always playing video games and never really, you know, socialized or got outside and r ran around, you know what I mean? And that never, never had been up against any confrontation or anything like that. And so first thing he does is pull out the gun and, and gets, gets a shooting because he's startled, you know what I mean? And it, it kind of makes yeah, sense. Oh, I was pretty deep when he said that. I was like, well. It's a complex thing, Randy. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of circumstances. These kids, that what you just said, that dynamic that you just reported. And then um, the idea that, these, the, first of all, the amount of firearms out there are way more powerful and way more uh, multi-shoot devices than when I was a young copper. And then um, uh, the fact that, you know, you just felt by socializing as a kid, you know, I, I grew up in a neighborhood Chicago is a, a, a city of neighborhoods and ethnic neighborhoods. And I grew up near the stockyards when they were still operating in an old Polish neighborhood, Lithuanian neighborhood. We had, there was a church every three blocks and there were the different parish, you know, so that's how you define yourself. Yeah, I'm from this parish, I'm from this parish. And we were all uh, Polish or Lithuanian. And then the neighborhood started to change, <coughs> excuse me, where there was an influx of Hispanics coming in and it was like at first you felt threatened you know it's like hey who, you know who are these people coming in we don't want to you know lose our status to all this and then 
what happened was we started to interact with them uh, by just being in our, our social media place was the park. We had a beautiful park uh, where we all hung out. And, and so they would come and we would socialize with them. And then pretty soon we'd end up uh, dating their, you know, some very beautiful girls that were Hispanic and, and they did the same. And, and we learned about each other. So we felt more comfortable and not threatened. You know, so um, when you become a police officer, then, I mean, I would work in some of the worst, what would be, you would call the worst, most violent areas in the city. And I never felt that I was a target while I was working there because the people knew why I was there. They knew what my mission was there. And they knew their, you know, criminals knew their circumstances. If they screwed up, they were going to get arrested. Um, they knew that was my job. <laughs> they knew when they screwed up. Uh, the people, you know, people, we forget that for every crime out there, there's a victim. And these victims are the little old ladies. They're the, the people that don't have a chance, that don't have any protection. They, don't, they can't afford uh, to have their houses monitored with fancy uh, burglar systems and alarm systems. These are the victims. And so uh, as a police officer, I can tell you this honestly, 90% of the police officers I worked with uh, through the years felt the same way. We felt that it was to go out and stop somebody from taking advantage of somebody else and, you know, to put the brakes on. And so it's like, um, and you see, you see, I seen a man break down. So he, he was just before Christmas, he had bought presents for his kids and he bought a Christmas tree. just having a nice Christmas. Somebody broke into his apartment, stole all the presents and the Christmas tree. And he just broke down and said, you know, you can't have nothing here. And it was like, I felt so bad for that guy. He was trying to struggle to help his kids. And it's like, what can you do? You know, I mean, it's, so it's, it's a whole different vibe. Like I said, I never felt uncomfortable. I'm mean, sure, you know, there were some big games and, and, and drugs and, and problems like that in the area that I worked. But they all, everybody knew area of uh, operation and they didn't they didn't cross that often i mean when so you get somebody that was you know out of his head on drugs or something now you're going to have a fight or he's or he's 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 just had enough or whatever he's not decides not going to jail and you, you're going to end up in a physical altercation yeah that happens sure it happens but again there wasn't anybody that from the neighborhood that was going to say hey uh let's stop the police from arresting this guy. It wasn't like that. They knew they, they knew the, the way the, the, the system worked, you know, so it's just different now. It's, everything's different. Yeah. Very, very different. Very. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I just thought that, I thought that was very in interesting insight when he's, I, it made me look at things a different, you know, way, you know, for uh, how, how, you know, pull, you know, police are, Obviously, there's, you know, are being looked at, looked upon because they never really had a good rep, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it's like, you really take a look at it, there's two different generations and you can pay yeah. attention and kind of tell the difference. They actually, you know, these young coppers go out there now. I mean, for the most part, your job, basic job as a police officer in the uniform is to go, go out on patrol. That means you have a certain area and you're supposed to find out what's going on in that area, suppress crime and, and make sure that, you know, you take care of whatever needs to be done relative to, to criminal justice related stuff in that area. So, but now these, these weapons out there are so powerful. Uh, there's, there's shootouts all the time. There's, there's homicides that were increasing the, again, the, 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 the criminals, they don't care about, uh, to, 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 to for me to be, for a criminal, for me, when, during my early part of my career, to be chasing a criminal and have him have a gun in his hand and turn around and shoot, shoot it at me, it was like unheard of. He knew he was going to prison for the rest of his life. Now, it's like nothing. They'll unloose whatever they can think they can get away with. There was a thousand carjackings like a year ago in Chicago. That means a thousand times somebody came up to somebody in a car, pulled a gun and said, get out of the car, I'm taking it. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's unheard of. It's just, it's just a breakdown. It, 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 it can't happen in a civilized society. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't. It really shouldn't.
Sometimes there was kids in the car. They took the car and didn't know there was kids in the back. And then, of course, then the police start chasing them and they crash. And then now the car's wrecked. And the person got, has no car. It's just a mess. You know, millions and millions of dollars worth of damage caused <coughs> by some of this stuff. Wow. Hey, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Listen closely. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And then you can listen to me, Brandy Joy, with a voice to be reckoned with. You know, I just tell, tell kids, like, you can, do one, you can do something that could affect what you do affects other people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it could, uh, it could be people that you never even met, just a domino effect by one person's choice. <laughs> sure, absolutely. You know, you know so yeah. many, how many, I can't tell you how many people are innocently going about their business and they ended up dead by yeah. just taking a long turn by being in the wrong place at the wrong time, by just, uh, uh, you know, whatever. They, they, yeah. they, they got up that morning and they ended up not making it through the day because somebody thoughtlessly did something to, to, to take their life, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's that part where you tell people, you'd be like, one minute you can be here, walk out the door, and yeah. the next minute you're gone. Yeah. Life is precious. Yeah, oh, is. man. Deep stuff, deep stuff. A woman that walked out of a bookstore uh, last year. She was doing nothing. She walked out of a bookstore. Some two knuckleheads were down the street shooting at each other, and, and a stray bullet hit her right in the head. It's gone. Dead. <sighs> so that, that, and that's part of, a, uh, I wanted to mention this movie that I, that I did. Um, it always struck me that uh, these deaths, uh, from seeing them in the police department and, and being involved in the military, uh, they they are not just um, incidents unto themselves. Like you mentioned just a little bit ago, they have ripple effects, and they affect. You know, uh, a mother gets killed, her children are affected, her grandkids, her her mother, uh, the whole family, and it's not just. Immediately, it just goes on for uh, for generation after generation. It affects the whole neighborhood, really. Every time someone uh, loses their life, yeah. so I I was struck by the idea of this. And I I wrote a uh, script, and uh, uh, it came to to mind very very well in in my head. And I decided to to have this done into a movie. So I <clears throat> did a short film, uh, hired some actors, and and. Uh, uh, a production company and a brilliant director, my friend uh, Mary Mary Reynard and um, uh, Mary Beth Liss, as she, as she goes by too. But um, anyway, we put this film together and, and it's called RPG. And RPG stands for Rocket Propelled Grenade. It's a it's a vicious weapon that's been used back oh even before Vietnam, I think. It was developed like around the time of Vietnam started, and they still use it. It's a it's a powerful rocket, a uh, shoulder-fired rocket, and it has what they call a shaped charge in it. And the, the, it, it, it could go through cement. It could, it could oh, penetrate man. cement and burn up what's ever inside behind the cement wall, for instance. So anyway, uh, it's about uh, the loss that a father experiences uh, as his son is, goes off to war, and the father's a veteran too. So, um, and how it affects generation to generation. So I'm very proud of the film. We, we won um, uh, several awards, and the main one was uh, uh, an outstanding um, actor award, which I'm very proud of, uh, at the uh, US International uh, LA Golden Film Awards in 2017. Wow. So um, it was very, very uh, just proud of the film. It's on Amazon Prime if anybody should like to to check it out. I, I, it, it transcends generation and transcends um, anybody who's experienced loss or, or can 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 
benefit, I think, from understanding to watch that film. So I invite yeah, you all to definitely. your listeners to, to view it. It's only 15 minutes without the credits. Definitely, definitely. And, I, and I'll definitely make sure that um, I, uh, I have a page and I'll give you the information later that I, I have for my, my uh, podcast and for the bullying um, advocacy. And I'll definitely put that up there um, where they can go to see, to check that okay. out. Excuse me, I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, in your time of, of, you know, working in the field, did you ever come across uh, uh, any type of situations concerning children and, and like bullying? If, 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 it may, if it were, you know, a child uh, committing uh, suicide or a child that, you know, mean what, uh, was planning or did, uh, you know, take a gun and, and you know, to, to school, like at any sort of type? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are several incidents like that where, you know, the, the, the anger and helplessness is built up so powerfully in, in a, a person that he feels like there's no way out. There's no choice. And so they yeah. do something yeah. rash like that, uh, to take a weapon to school or, uh, and it's in their mind, they, they, they believe it's like for defense to, to, to stop. They just want to stop. They just want it to stop. They want to stop from being embarrassed. They want to stop from being belittled. They want to stop from being physically hurt, mentally hurt. And so yeah. <clears throat> they, they need to, you know, quite often parents are, 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 they don't tell the parents they're embarrassed. They don't want to make a scene at school. They're non-confrontational. And so uh, it, it goes to the point where it, 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 drips over to the point where the there's violence involved and yeah. um, you know it's, it's, it's a terrible thing and, and that's why I, I'm, I'm so glad especially in these uh, in our time right uh, recently so many programs for anti-bullying and, and have been developed and um, I mean when I was in grammar school it was and I went to a Catholic grammar school I'm, I'm sad to say this it was a good school but you know they they missed the boat. If if somebody was uh, <clears throat> was uh, being bullied, I mean it was brutal. Some of the way the kids treated uh, kids that weren't the same, you know, in some regard, whether they had some physical uh, problem or something, you know, the kids would just make fun of them. And you you never realize the torment that uh, this person suffered. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> definitely. And that's the you know uh, you know my son. You know we he ex the last few, <clears throat> few years experienced, um, you know, some, you know, the backlash of bullying and I had to, you know, make a decision, especially when it became physical, you know, the next step I felt now is my duty as a parent to remove my child from, you know, the situation at hand. Cause you know, it's, it's going to happen everywhere and you can't like run from it, but at the same time you have to, I still had to make that choice of that environment alone. You know what I mean? Like, are you going to, what are you going to do to take the steps to make this better or change these kids? Right. You can't let it be, you have to give them consequences. You have to, you know, you make them account, held accountable for their actions. And I didn't, I don't, I still don't really see, see that a lot. You know, I hear a whole lot of, children committing suicides and the, and the domino effect you know what I mean because it you know, like you said you're a decision you make can affect many you know yeah. and and that's what's happening here but it seems like those kids aren't getting the picture you know no. and i just i just don't understand what why why is that because they'll just continue you know what i mean and then what was the end result for some kids i mean the youngest one i had I'd seen and that's what this last year struck accorded me with the um just to do my research more on bullying was when I saw that there was an eight year old kid that had did it. And I was just like, Whoa, where is he yeah. even having these thoughts of like, where is he, what is, who missed the ball on, you know what I mean? On yeah. that one, those signs yeah. there, you know, for them to yeah. go home and hang themselves. Yeah. I was yeah, just thrown back. You know, you look at these kids and they're so pure and so innocent and, and somehow, you know, they get corrupted with this either through, um, just, I don't know, neglect or the parent, you know, the, the important thing like you meant, like you did, and if you're a great example in this regard, you realized that there was a situation and you took some action, you know, and, and I think that's an important thing because the kids want to see what their parents are going to do. 
you know, they, 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 they don't want to, to see their parents just blow it off and say, well, you know, don't worry about it, it'll pass or something. They, they, you have to take action nowadays. You have to do something. You have to either contact the school, let them know that you're not going to tolerate it, uh, have some kind of intervention or something. Uh, and so I think a lot of situations, and I don't mean this in a, in a horribly negative way, but, you know, the breakdown of the traditional family doesn't help. You know, I mean, so many single women have to have such a burden to, 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 to try and, 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 and uh, do so, so many things to, to, to handle the job, pay the bills and, and raise the kids. It's just too much. Yeah. So it, you know, kids have to have, um, I was fortunate enough uh, to have both of my parents. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I'll tell you right now, I mean, it's just different times. If somebody was bullying me and my mother saw it, she'd confront them. She'd physically confront them. Grab by, and, and th but that's the way the whole neighborhood was. All the parents in the neighborhood knew each other. They were all from the same parish. We were all from the same school. And so you didn't get, first of all, you didn't get away with anything. Uh, if you did something three blocks away that you weren't supposed <laughs> to get, uh, your parents would know it, you know, before you got home even. By the time yeah. you got home, the street lights were on. And so, um, and now it's like everybody's just shut into their own little space and, and mm -hmm. you know, just, has, they're forced to that it's because they have to, you know, again, you had to pay the bills, you had to work these jobs <clears throat> and um, you got to do it, you know, so it's, yeah. it's, it's a different, again, it's a different time, but the kids need to know that they've got somebody that they can go to, that they can trust, that will, will intervene on their behalf. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. And we, we need more mentors. We need more people to, yeah. to be that place for, for kids and you know and that's and when this last incident with my son when I had to pull him out and find a whole nother school for him I made yeah. that in my head I finally made that choice of what I wanted to do what I do you know what I mean but I don't I want to be able to raise my son I want to be more accessible to him and mm -hmm. be able to spend more you know what I mean and not really have to be like you know like how you're saying like the, the single mom she has to yeah. okay we got to get you to school so you, maybe she's going to pick you up because I have to work this time this time we get home okay homework this this and that get you to bed next let's do it all over again I want to yeah. raise my son I want to be more in, involved right. and, and active right. and, and be able to if I want to make to be able to do that and right now if I want to you know keep a roof over our heads and keep us you know what I mean going I have to go to the job that I'm very grateful for but I really sure. my dream is really to raise when I say in raise I mean like raise my son yeah. to be involved, be involved and be able to yeah take him to certain because I want so many things for him great things for him but just by me not even being able to give it that time because that time I need to go earn <coughs> money I can't sure. even do that I want to give more of my time so that's my my goal for 220 is to be able to financially be in a situation to where I don't mm. I, well, I don't I have to really go to work I want to work you know what I mean like yeah, sure. you know yeah. but I want to be involved with with my well, I, 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 I have a routine that? with my little grandson now for mm -hmm. about uh, a year uh, I but at least once a week I pick him up uh, and I take him to he's fascinated with trains so we go to the train station and we just watch the commuter trains come and go. So, and then we go have a, I have a cup of coffee and, and we split a donut That's and we sit there and talk. And uh, it takes about 40 minutes, you know, the, the whole time that we're waiting, watching the trains. We watch two trains, the conductors wave at them, they know them, you know. And to me, that is the most important thing. Uh, yeah. This gives my son a break because he's always running around. My daughter-in-law is a teacher, so she's in school, you know, working all the time. So it gives him a, a – he loves doing that. If I don't do it for two or three days, he'll say, we, uh, Papa, we go to coffee shop? We go to coffee shop? We go to a donut shop? I said, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I make big time to do it. And um, just sitting there and talking about things and how school, how's your you – know, and it's, it, it, to me, it's, it, it's being involved, the most important thing. You know, yeah. you have any problems, uh, you know, anything you want to talk to, talk about. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. nothing, but, you know, just leave those communication lines open. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. we got to leave that. We have to build that, you know, with our 
because those those are moments that count, you know, they remember, and we have to build that with them so that they'll even know that they, because some kids feel like they can't go talk to their parents, which is understandable, right. you know what I mean? But, you know, as, you know, me growing up and this being my first and only child and being around kids all the time, you know what I mean? I learned a lot from, from you know what I mean, being other kids and have to deal with them. And, and, you know how to do it my son and we have to make it to where our kids feel safe to come to us I tell my son I don't care how mad you think I might get yeah. it doesn't even matter I said you come to me with any and everything you need to you talk to me about anything but I have yeah. to remember too to be open to it you know what I mean and make him feel comfortable when he does you know what I mean I can say it and then completely be something different so I mean I have to make sure that I allow him to do that with me because you know yeah, it's a balance. You know, you have yeah. to balance. Everything. You're juggling mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Tremendous yeah. respect mm -hmm. for people to try to yeah. get it all done. You know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Wow. The police officers, a lot of you know, when I first came on a job, 1972, the police job, there were no police women on the street. They they were working uh, in the uh, with youth offenders or with in the lockups as the female lockups there were so when they first came on the street to work like men you know like the, the male police officers it was really uh, really something so now it's much more integrated relative to male female and uh it's very difficult for a lot of uh, uh single moms you know because that are police officers because they work different hours you know sometimes they'll have to work their shift and they have to go to court and so they're trying to raise these kids. I, I, it's just, I have a tremendous respect for, for what they need to do. I don't know how they do it. You know? Yeah, sure. Good old grandma Thanks and grandma. Much. Thank God for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I'm like right now. My, uh, my mom and dad passed, but my son uh, spends a lot of time with his uh, dad's uh, mom and dad. And they actually are the ones helping me while I go to work right now and, you know, and get him and, and involved. So it's, it's a blessing, you know, yeah. but, you yeah. know, grandparents are amazing. <laughs> yeah, but that's good, though. See, let's, let's, we, have a, we have it made because we could dive in and then jump out and go right? home. Right, give them back. You're like, here's your baby. <laughs> it's yeah, funny because his are. grandpa, yeah, his grandfather's like, okay, he'll call me. I'll barely just get in the house. He's like, uh, one of them will call. he be like, are you home? I'm like, yep, yeah. just barely grace the door, but I'm here. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I get it, and I appreciate it because they don't have to. And you guys, you know, you guys done it all. You guys did your, you know, what I mean, raise your kids. <laughs> yeah, they're getting back what what they gave us. No. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> I was asking sure. myself, I was like, did I do this to my mother? <laughs> yeah. It's a smart mouth. I'm like, what'd you say? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh man. Well, that's I I I respect highly what you do and um and how you, you know, serve the country and, and how, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's not, not everybody can do it. You well, know, it's not for everybody, yeah. you know, you have to be, that's a lot of courage and, and self, you know, selfless and sacrifice. Well, I, I, you know, it's not, when, when I, would, I would join the Army when I was 17, I, I, was, I graduated high school a month and uh, I joined the Army when I was 17, but you know what? All my friends were joined, doing the same thing. You know, we were all, here's the other, here's how it's different too, Brandy. All of us were married by the time we were like 25. All of us. Oh, wow. Everybody that I knew was pretty much married by the time we were 25. We came back out of the service. I was 20 years old. I wasn't even 21. I couldn't, I, you know, couldn't even get a job. You know, I mean, you had to be like 21 for anything serious. And, uh, but we did, you know, and, and it was just a different time. Uh, I was when I hit Vietnam. I was uh, in October of 1967. I was 19. I was almost 19. I was I was 19 until that November. I mean, it's just a kid. We, we didn't know what the hell we were doing, you know. As far as uh, we were glad to serve. I mean, I never regretted it. Wow, that's amazing. Well, on that note. <laughs> um, so okay well this is what i want to say okay so i'm i'm gonna go ahead and, and take a guess that you retired and, and is that when you start tapping more into your your creative and, and directing yeah. and all and acting and stuff yeah yeah okay okay 
That's awesome. I um, classes and, and, you know, doing little, like I said, little community theater things. And Chicago's a great town for that. The, the, you know, um, so you learn and you meet other people and you meet, you know, you mingle with, you do some creative stuff and you meet with young people and, and think, uh, see how they think and how things are different. It's, it's good. It's a good thing. Okay. Well, definitely. I would like to know, can you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, the, the uh, projects that you've uh, been working on? Um, like, uh, I noticed there there was a movie oh, that was on the tip of my tongue too. Uh, it's actually the first one that popped um, popped in. It was called uh, uh, Okay, you know, throw it out there. Maybe that's the one. It was a few actually. I see, correct? But there's that's one. Uh huh. Well, you mean there's movies that I've done? Yeah, some things that you worked yeah. on. It was I was like briefly, you know what I mean, going because I couldn't, you know, get into yeah, them yeah. all. Well, you know, I, I like I said, I, I did the movie uh, Cesar Chavez, and I played and that was filmed out. It was interesting because that was filmed out in Mexico, and so when uh, they flew me down to Mexico, and I, I I had gotten the audition just before I left L.A., so I really didn't know that much about the film. So I knew I had uh, a few lines in the movie, and um, uh, it was in Hermosillo, Mexico. So I I they put me up at a at a holiday inn and it was very nice and um, by the pool uh, in the evening the the cast and the crew were filming during the day and so I'm sitting around the table and uh, having something to eat and the next thing I know I'm, I'm uh, this uh, Hispanic guy is talking to me I, he's looking at me uh, uh, on my cell phone I had something like a video playing and it was um, Michael Pena the actor whose son many movies you know and then this young lady was on the phone next to me and she got off the phone. She says, Oh, I'm so sorry. Please, um, uh, excuse me. I, 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 I mean to, uh, to, uh, didn't mean to ignore you. I don't want to meet you. My name is Rosario Dawson. So here's another big star and I'm sitting with them. Didn't even know who they were. So the next huh. day we went on the set and I find out that John Malkovich is in the movie. And I ended up doing an ad lib scene with John Malkovich that day. So it was very exciting. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was ex not, not a lot of fun when you're trying to do it because you're very nervous and tense and hope that you do it right. Uh, uh, but it was, that was a lot of fun. So uh, that movie was, was a, a nice, uh, got me in some nice uh, publicity, but I also have done a lot of independent films here. Um, uh, one of them recently was, it's, it's on um, Amazon Prime also. It's called The Origins of Wit and Humor. And it's, I do a nice little comedy scene in that one. I really enjoy. Um, and then I did a, a film, and this is what happens with actors, and you just have to understand this, what, what happens with the, the industry. Uh, it was a terrific film. It's called Searching for Venice. We filmed it uh, for about a month. I had a tremendous role in the film and a tremendous monologue uh, about, I, was, I played the, it was about a family, and I was the father in the family, and, and I'm dying of cancer. And it was just a, a beautifully done film, and it never, never got published. It never never saw the screen so i mean it's kind of a thing so um and then i did my film and then um, i'm thinking of another one i i i'm working on two scripts uh one is about uh from the 1980s about the first african-american detective that's assigned to an all white uh, blue collar detective area back in the 80s and that uh, i tried to make that pretty interesting and then uh, another, uh, that's called Gino Ginola, the Slick Boys. And then uh, they used to call detectives the Slick Boys on the street. Uh, oh, okay. Is that where I think that term came from, kind of? Uh, yeah, just because they, they uh, were able to solve murders by, uh, you know, bringing them in. And, and you know, it was like, uh, don't say nothing to the police. And before you know it, they would, they, they had the whole story. <laughs> <These guys get laughs> <lost. clears throat> because there was a way to, there was a way to, to kind of play one guy against another. You know, it's like uh, you, if you if you know the streets in Chicago, it's like with the game, um, they would do something, and then they, somebody would snitch. Yeah. Which fortunately, yeah. thank you, thankfully, and you round them up and you bring them in, and and so you would say like, okay, you. I know you were involved somehow. I don't have a videotape of it, but. You have to, to take the chance that your buddies who are in the next room aren't putting all this on you, you know. 
So, uh, you know, over the time, remember the, 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 the show NYPD Blue? Yes, yes, I do. It was a lot like that. It was like, but, but that show compressed the time-wise. You know, it just took, this took a long time between talking to people and you listen to people and they would lie to you. And then you'd go out and you'd investigate and find out that they were lying and come back and confront them. And so it was like, uh, it was like that. So it was an interesting, interesting time. Um, and so then uh, I also did, a, I had a, um, I forgot exactly how I got introduced to this, but I read about, I do, I do a lot about history. I love history. I, I, I study history, uh, especially history like World War II and, and the Korean War. <clears throat> and it's just amazing. It's just amazing. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, I found a, a, there's a town in Brazil, a little town. And the name of this town is called Candido Godoy, okay? And in this town, it's, if you picture South America, you picture people of like Latin, you know, I mean like olive skin or, or dark skin people with brown hair, dark features, et cetera, et cetera. But in this town, most of the people look like Europeans. There's really light blonde hair people and, and they all speak, Spanish because they speak in, in uh, Brazil. But anyway, in this town, <clears throat> there is a 1,000% greater incidence of twins than anywhere on earth. They have more twins, a 1,000% more twins in this town than anywhere in the world. And so nobody knows why. Wow. So, well, I did some more digging and have you ever heard the, the, the man called Joseph Mengele? No, I haven't. Okay. Back in World War II, in the concentration camps, specifically Auschwitz, Joseph Mengele was the doctor in charge of experiments with twins, with, with prisoners. And so he would experiment on twins trying to, he did horrible, horrible, I don't even want to go into the horrible things he did. Um, trying to make a master race for the Germans, for the Nazis. This was his goal. And so it was kind of genetic type things, but it was just all corrupted into terrible things. Well, anyway, when the war was over, he escaped. Guess where he went? Yeah. Candido Godoy, Brazil. Wow. And he worked there secretly under a different name. It's kind of a, uh, kind of a, a medic to help. It's like a farm, farming town. You know, he would help with the farmers and help with the kids and he would help be. And so people have this mysterious suspicion that somehow he's responsible for all these twins, but it's never been proven. <clears throat> so it struck me as being interesting. So I built this whole story around it. And that's a, it's called Devil's Dynasty. It's another script that I have and I'm turning it into a novel too. So I'm trying to sell uh, the scripts, both of these scripts, and uh, and uh, and the novel too. I'm a good manager. Oh, oh you, you're a man of many talents. Well, let's put it this way: I, I wish I could master one of them because I still play the same thirty chords on the guitar terribly that I did when I first <laughs> got the guitar in 1966. My son is a musician. My son is a master musician. He plays in about five bands. Unfortunately. He, they, it's impossible for musicians to make money nowadays. It's almost impossible. Yeah, yeah. It would be, you know, that'd be cool. I, I think that would be um, so awesome if that <clears throat> were, you know, because like for for instance, for like with kids and all, I, I feel like connecting with their ta talents and stuff could prevent a lot of the things that go on as far as like oh, bullying yeah. and this and that because they get bored. Kids get bored. You know, yeah, they always. go to school, they really don't want to be in those classrooms. And, and some of them do like the learning and some of them get that they need education, but it's still like not interesting. And I've always been a believer of making education fun. Okay. That's just yeah. what, how it is. We're dealing with kids. That's how you get their attention. You got to, you got to, you got to make fun for them, you yeah. know? So that's why I'm always trying to come up with ways to definitely like <clears throat> inspire, inspire them, you know? And it's like. Like, I feel like we tell, we tell our kids you can be anything 
you want to be, you know, but I always in the back of my head, I'm like, well, not anything. I, I don't want you going out saying I want to be a robber or anything like that, but I don't say it. I just assume that you, that you have common sense. <laughs> but then, you know, you said, you know, I had someone tell me the other day that told their parent, you know, what they wanted to be. And they were like, what? Who's doing that? And, you know, it pertained to like, you know, entertainment, you know, they wanted to, uh, I think it was, um, had something to do with uh, acting or, or music, you know, but, it, you know, with, with a lot of people or, you know, adults, they don't see that. They see when you want to be anything, they, they see doctor. That's the first thing you're going to hear a parent or something say, doctor, lawyer, you know, those like, I guess those are the norms, uh, police officer, stuff like that. Those are the norms, firefighter, you know, say, oh, actress, actor, you know what I mean? It's like, why not? <laughs> you know well, I mean? why not? Yeah, it's just that, but the thing is that there's, especially out where you are, you know, I mean, I was in the LA scene and I understand these young kids are, are driven to, to do this. And, and the, 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 it's like trying to be a, get into the NBA if you play basketball when you're in high school. You know, I mean, it's like the odds of you succeeding to the point where you don't have to do anything else are, are tremendously against you, you know. It's like saying I want to be an astronaut. You know, there's only so many astronauts, and there's so many. And so, you 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 either have to to maintain that and suffer the consequences, meaning that you can't expect to to to, to hit the what the, what you know the, the financial rewards that some of the the, the tier one actors uh, benefit from. You have to be satisfied with your craft, with be, do, making work that is memorable and meaning, meaningful. You have to be satisfied with, with not having, um, you know, the, the latest cars or anything like that. Because most people don't. I mean, it's like it's, it's like. So you could do that, or you could try to do it different ways, like I do. Uh, I couldn't stay in L.A. My mother was sick. I could only go three months at a time. Well, you can't do anything out there so I was happy with what I did and um, tried to do some more work here uh, now my wife had a couple of, uh, over the past few years had some uh, medical issues where she had a couple knee replacements and stuff and so then now my and then my mother was again she passed away last year so then now I don't want to be out there I don't want to leave my grandkids for more than th for three months they'll be different people when I come back so I, I, I don't I don't want to go out there. I, I, I try to do creative. Just before this, uh, your show started, I, I was editing one of my scripts. I keep editing it, and editing it. And I spend hours and hours and hours. You know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a, it's a it's always a compromise. You have to decide what you want to do. You want to, you, you go all in for so long. You set goals. If you don't make them, what do you leave, or do you stay with it? I know an actress that uh, uh, she's always she's in her 60s now and she she has nothing i mean she she puts on she's tremendous she puts on these tremendous plays but she's always living on the cuff you know she's always looking for a ride from somebody or and she accepts that you know so it's like it's difficult you know? yeah for sure for sure yeah that's true that is, you make you make a very valid you know valid valid point for that when you say that too because it also is the it's it's realistic and uh, you know, a lot of kids or people think that that they just see the the glitz, the glam, and you know what I mean. Some people just struck it, you know what I mean, good. You know what I mean. And some people it just it just worked out for them that way. And, and some people have been doing it as long as the people that struck it good and are still at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and That's some people just were happy where they where they're at in their career and and, and right. with it. Well, we don't see them anymore. We just assume like ah, you fell yeah. off. They're, they're probably just okay with what the with, with where they're at. Yeah. Well, it's like the business is an entertainment business. You know, if you're in front of the uh, camera, for the most part, age plays uh, works against you. You know, you've got so many years where you're at your peak, and and uh, yeah. those, you know, you can do right work. with that money. <laughs> Put your money yeah. away. Spend wisely. <laughs> uh, it's just difficult. It's just difficult. Although there's more opportunities with more streaming and more cable and more shows and Netflix and doing all these shows, there's more opportunities. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, wow. So, so do you have? Uh, I don't. I, I had a brain fart. I was trying to. I was trying to play it off. <laughs> oh, this is the norm. I was telling somebody I was in a show the other day, and it just it just happened, and I was just like, ah, oh, 
crap. <laughs> I just went with the flow, but yeah, I'll just come back. It'll come back to me. But I want to ask you, do you have a social media page or, or do you want to um, let the listeners yeah. know where they can go to find um, anything sure. they need to know about you? Well, I, I have uh, 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 the pages. The page for my movie is Unofficial RPG. It's on Facebook. They wouldn't let me use just the three letters. I had to make it Unofficial RPG. But that's on Facebook. And that tells you about the movie and where you can find it. It's on Amazon Prime, like I said. If you just if you go to Amazon, you got if you have or, or, even if you don't have Amazon Prime, and just look up RPG movie, uh, you'll see it there. And so that's the way. I'm on Instagram. Uh, uh, on Facebook, I'm under Joey G Man. That's my name on Facebook for different reasons. Okay, Joey G Man. Well, that explains why I couldn't find you. <laughs> I do have my under my name, but uh, uh, again, being a police officer, I, I protect my uh, my family uh, identity pretty much. For sure, know. very understandable. Okay, okay, that's why I came back to me. Um, something stood out for me also when I was uh, looking at you know, I think I was under ID. I I would say wrong. I get I get the letters IBDM or IDBM. <laughs> Yeah, I'm on the end there, under Joe Ganderski. Yeah, under my name. Okay. Yes. But I saw, too, because your, your career is so colorful, um, I, I saw that you were a negotiator. Oh, yeah. I did that, too. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. Very, you know, that was probably one of the most challenging things that I've ever done. Uh, because you go to chaotic situations uh, and you try to make sense out of them, and you have to do it pretty quickly. So I, I had been... Involved in about twenty different ones in my career. Wow, that's that's or something. You're holding somebody hostage, or hold up in a building, or threatening to kill themselves, or, or you know, yeah. I, I assume with that you have to be very, very careful, obviously, but very good and careful with your words when you're trying to negotiate someone out of. Right. Well, we were trained good. by a combined. Uh, uh, training by the FBI and the, and the Chicago Police Department developed a specific uh, operating procedure for how that went down. So um, there were certain things that we would do. There were certain uh, things that we would not say. Certain things that we, you know, would say. And let's just let me just tell you this: when you see somebody uh, on TV bring the wife to the where the husband's threatened to kill himself, and they bring the wife, we would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the that's the worst strategy in the world. Nobody does that. That's anything about negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> well, would that possibly be because you never know she might strike something in him or? or... <laughs> yeah, exactly. That might, might be the reason he's messed up that day. You know, now that's, I... that's cool. That's right. You just made me think of that too. That makes sense now. I, I probably I swear every time I see a movie now that that has has yeah. that situation on. <laughs> I like, don't bring her. <laughs> Let's bring this my hair, my hair. Here's your mom, mom. Oh no, don't bring her. She's the reason I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so funny. And, that, and that's one of the things too, like to, to talk to actually a real. You know, I mean, like what, what you've done and and a nego- real, you actually were a negotiator and all that stuff. You have to like distinguish TV from from real life. You know what I mean? And some people have a tendency to think that oh, that's how it is on TV. That's how it is in real life. And I'm like, so I. You know, I'm really excited that, you know, to actually talk to a real, <laughs> you know. It's very challenging, you know, because like I say, you, you put, was, first of all, a per, person is very distraught. So, you, of course, and that's why they're involved in that activity. So, um, you have to understand, uh, first of all, how, how to set up physically so you can communicate safely with that person. Uh, and then uh, a strategy to... Um, bring the tension down to the point where you can uh, rationally talk about how this could work for that person to to give up their position and then how to safely take that person into custody uh, so that you're okay and that person's okay and everybody else is okay so there's a it's a whole operating procedure, strategy, uh, philosophy about how that's really done. You know, so there's things that, like you say, there's things that you would never do. There's things that you would 
people that you would never get involved in, with and there's people that uh, uh, there's other things that you would never promise somebody or, or, or you know there's a whole thing that that you know the, the time usually works on your side if some if there's say, say a guy's holed up in his house and he's high on drugs and he's smashing all his furniture and he, his wife ran out of the house and the kids are out you know and he's there alone well let him smash it up and give him time you know let him blow off all that extra stress eventually you'll either get tired of it or you just fall asleep or the drugs will wear off or the alcohol will wear off and wear out like that, huh? <laughs> so, that's if you have time if you have people who aren't being threatened you know yeah. a lot of time so. oh. what's the youngest age um, that you had to negotiate uh, you know to have a situation where you had to know to negotiate with someone oh, I think uh, I think back about a couple of them Uh, usually young men in their 20s you know they get frustrated with life or whatever or they're in debt their 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 marriages or their girlfriends are going south they get uh, either drunk or, or hopped up on, uh, on some kind of uh, substance abuse and and uh, they've just, maybe they just got fired or, or you know whatever and they just hit it and uh, they're threatening to kill themselves or anybody else who comes in there to get them you know that type of thing yeah. Both of our their 20s or you know early 20s uh, or <clears throat> mid 20s you know, mm-hmm. old people don't usually you know you, you get burned out of, of criminality by the time you're 40 50 it used to be that way anyway wow I bet you your first one was pretty uh probably intense or because you know it's the first time for everything so when you yeah. go through these things and then you actually get your first one like that That's yeah, the first, first one was a very dangerous one. In fact, the first one, I ended up, uh, the first one, the guy should have got shot. It was, uh, who was, uh, he was shooting, he was shooting up the street. This is during the daytime, in the afternoon. Oh, my. Uh, and he was, uh, uh, corral, we, we contained him in a certain location, and uh, he started to move, and uh, I was down, I was down the alley, and trying to, trying to get, Give a situation where I could talk to him and he kept moving and uh, he ended up moving towards me and I had to back off <clears throat> and I ended up being in a, a little uh, like an apartment uh, doorway where it was recessed from the street but he was like uh, standing by the car and he had a gun in his hand and I had my gun down by my side and you know I'm waiting for somebody to say We have, of course, snipers on the guy now, and uh, all I was waiting for is for him to start raising that gun, and I'd had to shoot him. And so, uh, fortunately, he didn't, and um, he ended up getting uh, tackled, or I think later on, you know, a little while later, they, they ended up grabbing him. Nobody got hurt, and he didn't get hurt. Yeah, well, so he was, we were, here's what we were afraid of. We were afraid he was going to outrun the containment, meaning we had an area contained like a block, he was in and that was covered by snipers on the roof and, and, and police officers at the exits and everything but you know and he was armed so I mean if he would have ran past out that containment meaning say he tried to get uh, jump in a passing car you know or something and now he now he's mobile you know he can go anywhere yeah. so yeah. you had to make a decision of trying to let him go mobile or not so it's, all this stuff is happening like rapid fire you know, You try and just use your wits to, to keep it uh, from getting out of hand. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I... Hello. That was an interesting one. Yeah. It was... Yeah, I bet. Uh, <clears throat> like I said before, not everybody can do it, and I commend you for it. And you said something very important. You said uh, at some point you get burnt out on it, and that makes sense because you see so much pain and so much things yeah. that probably people will never uh, I will never have seen or, or when you come close to seeing it you actually had to see so uh, I'm pr- pretty sure it was really refreshing for you to turn over into your your craft and what you you know what I mean yeah. your, uh, your outlet and what you love to do yeah it's like all right look you, you, you don't like the way I'm doing the scene I don't care I, I went through all this other stuff my whole life These are little things now in life. You know what I mean? They're, they're, yeah, they're just, for sure. Stuff. There's other soldiers and 
uh, you know, it, it, this is nothing. There's, there's, you, you put a new perspective on the important things of life, you know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Wow. Well, <clears throat> I thank you for sharing, being able to share, you know, the, you know, what you've shared with us here today. And um, I've learned a lot, you know, you know, even a little, <laughs> just feel like I've, I've learned a lot because you've done so much and uh, that's pretty amazing. And I, I really adore that you are, you're one of those hands-on grandparents and, you know, you, you know, it's that type to where your grandparents, you sitting there and you're telling your, your grandkids, you know, stories, you know, the stuff that they could take keep with them and, you know, yeah. and that's, that's pretty cool. Well, that's it's pretty all good. Cool. I mean, it's good. I try it. You know, when I hit 70, I'm over 70 now. When I hit 70, it kind of was an awakening to me. You know, I've lost a couple friends already and uh, you don't know, you know, you, you just have to be ready and you want to make sure that you're you do the things that you need to do to, 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 if something happens that you can handle it and you can handle it dig with dignity and, and, and leave leave your friends and your family uh, something good to, to remember you by. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I'm definitely excited to go on and check out them your work. And is there anything, I know that obviously you're going to keep, there's going to be stuff coming, but is there any type of, uh, is there anything that you have it that you wanted to probably try, like a, any type of genre of, of, a, of a movie that you've been interested in, but you haven't done? But it's oh, like oh yeah, I would like... love, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, there's some really good movies out there. I've been watching a lot of foreign films lately. You know, I was asked to be a judge uh, for the Chicago International Children's Film Festival. And uh, it's the largest one, I didn't, I didn't know this. A lot of people. Know. It's the largest one in the world here in Chicago, and I, I watched eight feature films, and they were all foreign films, and they were four. They were they were done by adults, but they were for children, probably preteen to teen, and they were absolutely fantastic. And last year, four of them uh, got nominated for Academy Awards, and this year, uh, three of them I, I just felt were so well done and so exciting. Um, so just they're not you know shoot them up blow them up like we we do here you know there's stories of, of people and their relationships and how they grow uh, they're very well done I mean there's there's a lot of good movies out there uh, <clears throat> um, I'd love to be in a uh, I'd, I'd love to do another movie I mean, it's just it's just hard I have a manager out in LA and it's hard for her because I'm here and uh, in Chicago with limited uh, access to do auditions and stuff. I've done a few taped auditions, videotape, but it's it's hard. You know, you, you it's better when a director sees you. Uh, I'm looking for something to do now that's meaningful and memorable. And I've I've, I've I've got a few short scripts. I was thinking of doing one or two of those, but it's got to really move me because uh, I all I always uh, uh, finance them myself. So uh, you know, it costs several thousand dollars to even do a short film. So. Yeah, the independent thing is really big now. Oh, yeah. the films. If you could do a film, you know, an independent, even an independent film, which, or to do it right, it costs you a couple hundred thousand dollars at minimum. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I could talk with Joe all day. Hope you guys like the show. Thanks, Joe.